कृष्ण चैतन्ना प्रभो निदानंदी And now, Chapter Eight: The Avatars. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Vadadhan Sri Basadi Gopaka. Lord Chaitanya continued to explain to Sanatan Goswami that the expansions of Lord Krishna, who come to the material creation, are called avatars or incarnations. The word avatar means one who descends, and in this case, the word specifically refers to one who descends from the spiritual sky. In the spiritual sky, there are innumerable Vaikuntha planets. And from these planets, the expansions of the supreme personality of Godhead come into this universe. The first descent of the supreme personality of Godhead from the expansion of Sankarshan is the Purusha incarnation, Maha Vishnu. It is confirmed in Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto One, Chapter Three, Verse One, that when the supreme personality of Godhead descends as the first Purusha incarnation of the material creation, he immediately manifests sixteen elementary energies. Known as the Mahavishnu, he lies within the causal ocean, and it is he who is the original incarnation in the material world. He is the Lord of time, nature, cause and effect, mind, ego, the five elements, the three modes of nature, the senses, and the universal form. Although he is the master of all objects, movable and immovable in the material world, he is totally independent. The influence of material nature cannot reach beyond the viraja or causal ocean, as confirmed in Shrimad Bhagavatam. Canto Two, Chapter Nine, Verse Ten. The modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, as well as material time, have no influence on the Vaikuntha planets. On those planets, the liberated associates of Krishna live eternally, and they are worshipped both by the demigods and the demons. Material nature acts in two capacities: as Maya and Pradhan. Maya is the direct cause, and Pradhan refers to the elements of the material manifestation. When the first Purusha avatar, Mahavishnu, glances over the material nature, material nature becomes agitated, and the Purusha avatar thus impregnates matter with living entities. Simply by the glance of the Mahavishnu, consciousness is created. And this consciousness is known as Mahatattva. The predominating deity of the Mahatattva is Vasudeva. This created consciousness is then divided into three departmental activities according to the three gunas or modes of material nature. 
consciousness in the mode of goodness is described in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. The predominating deity of the mode of goodness is called Aniruddha. Consciousness in the mode of material passion produces intelligence, and the predominating deity in this case is Pradyumna. He is the master of the senses. Consciousness in the mode of ignorance causes the production of ether, the sky, and the sense of hearing. The cosmic manifestation is a combination of all these modes, and in this way innumerable universes are created. No one can count the number of universes. These innumerable universes are produced from the pores of the Mahavishnu's body. As innumerable particles of dust pass through the tiny holes in a screen, similarly from the pores of the Mahavishnu's body innumerable universes emanate. As he breathes out, innumerable universes are produced, and as he inhales, they are annihilated. All of the energies of the Mahavishnu are spiritual, and they have nothing to do with the material energy. In Brahma Samhita, chapter 5, verse 48, it is stated that the predominating deity of each universe, Brahma, lives only during one breath of the Mahavishnu. Thus Mahavishnu is the original super-soul of all the universes and the master of all universes as well. The second Vishnu incarnation, the Garbhodakashayi Vishnu, enters each and every universe, spreads water from his body, and lies down on that water. From his navel, the stem of a lotus flower grows, and on that lotus flower, the first creature, Brahma, is born. Within the stem of that lotus flower are fourteen divisions of planetary systems, which are created by Brahma. Within each universe, the Lord is present as the Garbhodakashayi Vishnu, and He maintains each universe and tends to its needs. Although He is within each material universe, the influence of material energy cannot touch Him. When it is required, this very same Vishnu takes the form of Lord Shiva and annihilates the cosmic creation. The three secondary incarnations, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva are the predominating deities of the three modes of material nature. The master of the universe, however, is the Garbhodakashayi Vishnu, who is worshipped as the Hiranya Garbha Super Soul. The Vedic hymns describe him as having thousands of heads. Although he is within the material nature, he is not touched by it. The third incarnation of Vishnu, Kshiro Dakashayi Vishnu, is also an incarnation of the mode of goodness. He is also the super-soul of all living entities, and he resides on the ocean of milk within the universe. Thus Chaitanya Mahaprabhu described the Purusha avatars. Lord Chaitanya next described the Leela avatars, or pastime avatars, and of these the Lord points out that there is no limit. However, he describes some of them, for example, Matsya, Kurma, Raghunath, Nursinga, Vamana, and Varaha. As far as the Guna avatars, or qualitative incarnations of Vishnu, are concerned, they are three, Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva. Brahma is one of the living entities, but due to his devotional service, he is very powerful. This primal living entity, master of the mode of material passion, is directly empowered by the Garbhodakashayi Vishnu to create innumerable living entities. In Brahma Samhita, chapter 5, verse 49, Brahma is likened to valuable jewels influenced by the rays of the sun and the sun is likened to the Supreme Lord Garbhodakashayi Vishnu. 
If in some kalpa there is no suitable living entity capable of acting in Brahma's capacity, Garbodakashai Vishnu himself manifests as Brahma and acts accordingly. Similarly, by expanding himself as Lord Shiva, the Supreme Lord is engaged when there is a need to annihilate the universe. Lord Shiva, in association with Maya, has many forms, which are generally numbered at eleven. Lord Shiva is not one of the living entities. He is, more or less, Krishna himself. The example of milk and yogurt is often given in this regard. Yogurt is a preparation of milk, but still yogurt cannot be used as milk. Similarly, Lord Shiva is an expansion of Krishna, but he cannot act as Krishna, nor can we derive the spiritual restoration from Lord Shiva that we derive from Krishna. The essential difference is that Lord Shiva has a connection with material nature, but Vishnu or Lord Krishna has nothing to do with material nature. In Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 88, Verse 3, it is stated that Lord Shiva is a combination of three kinds of transformed consciousness known as Vaikarika, Taijasa, and Tamasa. The Vishnu Incarnation, although master of the modes of goodness within each universe, is in no way in touch with the influence of material nature. Although Vishnu is equal to Krishna, Krishna is the original source. Vishnu is a part, but Krishna is the whole. This is the version given by Vedic literatures. In Brahma Samhita, the example is given of an original candle which lights a second candle. Although both candles are of equal power, one is accepted as the original and the other is said to be kindled from the original. The Vishnu expansion is like the second candle. He is as powerful as Krishna, but the original Vishnu is Krishna. Brahma and Lord Shiva are obedient servants of the Supreme Lord, and the Supreme Lord as Vishnu is an expansion of Krishna. After describing the Leela and Guna avatars, Lord Chaitanya explains the Manvantara avatars to Sanatan Goswami. He first states that there is no possibility of counting the Manvantara avatars. In one kalpa, or one day of Brahma, fourteen manus are manifest. One day of Brahma is calculated at four billion three hundred and twenty million years, and Brahma lives for one hundred years on this scale. Thus, if fourteen manus appear in one day of Brahma, there are four hundred and twenty manus during one month of Brahma, and during one year of Brahma, there are 5,040 Manus. Since Brahma lives for 100 of his years, it is calculated that there are 504,000 Manus manifest during the lifetime of one Brahma. Since there are innumerable universes, no one can imagine the totality of the Manvantara incarnations. Because all the universes are produced simultaneously by the exhalation of the Mahavishnu, no one can begin to calculate how many Manus are manifest at one time. Each Manu, however, is called by a different name. The first Manu is called Svayambhuva, and he is the son of Brahma. The second Manu, Svarochisa, is the son of the predominating deity of fire. The third Manu is Uttama, and he is the son of King Priyavrata. The fourth Manu, Tamasa, is the brother of Uttama. The fifth Manu, called Raivata, and the sixth Manu, Chakshusha, are both brothers of Tamasa. But Chakshusha is the son of Chakshu. The seventh Manu is called Vaivasvata, and he is the son of the sun god. 
The eighth Manu is called Savarni, and he is also a son of the sun god, born of a wife named Chaya. The ninth Manu, Daksha Savarni, is the son of Varuna. The tenth Manu, Brahma Savarni, is the son of Upashloka. Four other Manus are known as Rudra Savarni, Dharma Savarni, Deva Savarni, and Indra Savarni. After describing the Manu incarnations, Lord Chaitanya explained the Yuga avatars to Sanatan Goswami. There are four Yugas or millennia, Satya, Treta, Dvapara and Kali, and in each millennium the Supreme Lord incarnates, and each incarnation has a different color according to the Yuga. In the Satya Yuga, the color of the principal incarnation is white. In the Treta Yuga, the color is red. In the Dvapara Yuga, the color is blackish, Krishna. And in the Kali Yuga, the color of the principal incarnation is yellow, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This is confirmed in Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 8, Verse 13, by the astrologer Gargamuni, who calculated Krishna's horoscope in the house of Nanda Maharaj. In the Satya Yuga, the process of self-realization was meditation, and this process is taught by the white incarnation of God. This incarnation gave a benediction to the sage Kardama by which he could have an incarnation of the personality of Godhead as his son. In the Satya Yuga, everyone meditated on Krishna, and each and every living entity was in full knowledge. In this present age, Kali Yuga, people who are not in full knowledge are still attempting this meditative process which was recommended for a previous age. The process for self-realization recommended in the Treta millennium was the performance of sacrifice and this was taught by the red incarnation of God. In the Dvapara millennium, Krishna was personally present and he was worshipped by everyone by the mantra Namaste Vasudevaya, Namaha Sankarshanaya, Radyumna Yani Rudaya, Tubyam Bhagavate Namaha, which means, quote, Let me offer my obeisances unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vasudeva, Sankarshan, Pradyumna, and Aniruddha, unquote. This was the process of self-realization for the Dvapara age. In the next millennium, this present age of Kali Yuga, the Lord incarnates to preach the chanting of the holy name of Krishna. In this age, the Lord is yellow, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and He teaches people love of God by chanting the names of Krishna. This teaching is carried out personally by Krishna, and He exhibits love of Godhead by chanting, singing, and dancing with thousands of people following Him. This particular incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is foretold in Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11, Chapter 5, Verse 32. Krishna Varnam, Visha Krishnam, Sango Pangastra Parshadam, Yagyai Sankirtan Prayer, Yajanti Hi Sume Dasaha, which means, quote, in the age of Kali, the Lord incarnates as a devotee, yellowish in color, and is always chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Although he is Krishna, his complexion is not blackish like Krishna's in Dwapara Yuga, but is golden. It is in Kali Yuga that the Lord engages in preaching love of Godhead through the Sankirtan movement, and those living entities who are intelligent adopt this process of self-realization.
It is also stated in Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 12, Chapter 3, Verse 52, Krite yad dayayato vishnum, Tretayam yajato makai, Dvapare paricharyayam, Kalo tadhari kirtanat, which means, quote, The self-realization which was achieved in the Satya millennium by meditation, in the Treta millennium by the performance of different sacrifices, and in the Dvapra millennium by worship of Lord Krishna, can be achieved in the age of Kali simply by chanting the holy names Hare Krishna. Unquote. This is also confirmed in Vishnu Purana, Canto 6, Chapter 2, Verse 17, where it is stated, Yayan Krite Yajan Yagyais, Tretayam Dvapare Richayan, Yad Apnoti Tad Apnoti, Kalo Sankirtya Keshavam, which means, quote, In this age there is no use in meditation, sacrifice, and temple worship. Simply by chanting the holy name of Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, one can achieve perfect self-realization. Unquote. When Lord Chaitanya described the incarnation for this age of Kali, Sanatan Goswami, who had been a government minister and was perfectly capable of drawing conclusions, directly asked of the Lord, How can one understand the advent of an incarnation? By the description of the incarnation for the Kali millennium, Sanatan Goswami could understand that Lord Chaitanya was indeed that incarnation of Krishna. And he could also understand that in the future there would be many people who would try to imitate Lord Chaitanya, because the Lord played as an ordinary Brahmin, despite the fact that his devotees accepted him as an incarnation. Since Sanatan knew that there would be many pretenders, he asked the Lord, How can one understand the symptoms of an incarnation? As one can understand the different incarnations for different millenniums by referring to Vedic literatures, the Lord replied, one can similarly understand who is actually the incarnation of Godhead in this age of Kali. In this way, the Lord especially stressed reference to authoritative scriptures. In other words, one should not whimsically accept a person as an incarnation, but should try to understand the characteristics of an incarnation by referring to scriptures. An incarnation of the Supreme Lord never declares himself to be an incarnation, but his followers must ascertain who is an incarnation and who is a pretender by referring to authoritative scriptures. Any intelligent person can understand the characteristics of an avatara by understanding two features, the principal feature, called personality, and the marginal features. In the scriptures, there are descriptions of the characteristics of the body and the activities of an incarnation, and the description of the body is the principal feature by which an incarnation can be identified. The activities of the Incarnation are the marginal features. This is confirmed in the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 1, Verse 1, where the features of an avatara are nicely described. In that verse, the two terms Param and Satyam are used, and Lord Chaitanya indicates that these words reveal Krishna's principal feature. The other marginal features indicate that he taught Vedic knowledge to Brahma and incarnated as the Purusha Avatara to create the cosmic manifestation. These are occasional features manifest for some special purposes. 
one should be able to understand and distinguish the principal and marginal features of an avatar. No one can declare himself an incarnation without referring to these two features. An intelligent man will not accept anyone as an avatar without studying the principal and marginal features. When Sanatan Goswami tried to confirm Lord Chaitanya's personal characteristics as being those of the incarnation of this age, Lord Chaitanya himself indirectly made the confirmation by simply saying, let us leave aside all these discussions and continue with the description of the Shaktyavesha avatars. The Lord then pointed out that there is no limit to the Shaktyavesha avatars and that they cannot be counted. However, some can be mentioned as examples. The Shaktyavesha incarnations are of two kinds, direct and indirect. When the Lord Himself comes, He is called Sakshat or a direct Shaktyavesha avatar. And when he empowers some living entity to represent him, that living entity is called an indirect or avesha incarnation. Examples of indirect avatars are the four Kumaras, Narad, Prithu, and Parashurama. These are actually living entities, but there is specific power given to them by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When a specific opulence of the Supreme Lord is invested in specific entities, they are called Avesha avatars. The four Kumaras specifically represent the Supreme Lord's opulence of knowledge. Nodded represents the devotional service of the Supreme Lord. Devotional service is also represented by Lord Chaitanya, who is considered to be the full representation of devotional service. In Brahma, the opulence of creative power is invested, and in King Prithu, the power for maintaining the living entities is invested. Similarly, in Parashurama, the power for killing evil elements is invested. As far as Vibhuti, or the special favor of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is concerned, it is described in the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita that a living entity who appears to be especially powerful or beautiful should be known to be especially favored by the Supreme Lord. Examples of direct or sakshad avatars are the Shesha Incarnation and the Ananta Incarnation. In Ananta, the power for sustaining all planets is invested, and in the Shesha Incarnation, the power for serving the Supreme Lord is invested. After describing the Shaktyavesha incarnations, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu began to speak about the age of the Supreme Lord. He said that the Supreme Lord Krishna is always like a 16-year-old boy, and when he desires to descend on this universe, he first of all sends his father and mother, who are his devotees, and then he advents himself as an incarnation, or he comes personally. All his activities, beginning with the killing of the Putana demon, are displayed in innumerable universes, and there is no limit to them. Indeed, at every moment, at every second, his manifestations and various pastimes are seen in different universes or Brahmandas. Thus his activities are just like the waves of the Ganges River. Just as there is no limit to the flowing of the waves of the Ganges, there is no cessation of Lord Krishna's incarnations in different universes. From childhood, he displays many pastimes, and ultimately he exhibits the Ras dance. It is said that all the pastimes of Krishna are eternal, and this is confirmed in every scripture. 
Generally, people cannot understand how Krishna performs his pastimes, but Lord Chaitanya clarified this by comparing his pastimes to the orbit of the earth about the sun. According to Vedic astrological calculations, the 24 hours of a day and night are divided into 60 dandas. The days are again divided into 3,600 palas. The sun disk can be perceived in every 60 palas, and that time constitutes a danda. Eight dandas make one prahada, and the sun rises and sets within four prahadas. Similarly, four prahadas constitute one night, and after that the sun rises. Similarly, all the pastimes of Krishna can be seen in any of the universes just as the sun can be seen in its movement through 3,600 palas. Lord Krishna remains in this universe for only 125 years, but all the pastimes of that period are exhibited in each and every universe. These pastimes include his appearance, his boyhood activities, his youth, and his later pastimes up to those pastimes at Dwarka. Since all these pastimes are present in one or another of the myriad universes at any given time, they are called eternal. The sun is eternally existing, although we see it rise and set, appear and disappear according to our position on the planet. Similarly, the Lord's pastimes are going on, although we can see them manifest in this particular universe only at certain intervals. His abode is the supreme planet known as Goloka Vrindavan and by his will this Goloka Vrindavan is manifested in this universe and in other universes as well. Thus the Lord is always in his supreme abode Goloka Vrindavan and by his supreme will his activities there are also manifested in innumerable universes. When he appears he appears in those particular places and in every manifestation his six opulences are displayed. <laughs> 